The Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or North Korea as we've come to know it, has been sealed off from the outside world since 1953. The antics of its former leader Kim Jong-il fueled an entire industry of sensational stories that clogged the internet and even mainstream media. But how much of what we're told about North Korea is actually true? I'm Stu, this is Debunked, and we're here to sort the truths from the myths and the facts from the misconceptions. Let's take a look at a handful of reports you'll probably have come across since Kim Jong-un became supreme leader back in 2011. In 2012, shortly after he came into power, a story circulated that Jong-un had assassinated his pop star girlfriend, Hyung Song Woo, for making a sex tape. However, a year after her reported murder, she made a miraculous appearance on state television, delivering a speech at a national art workers rally. She didn't seem particularly disheveled, considering she'd just risen from the dead. In 2013, a gruesome report spread like wildfire that the Supreme Leader had executed his uncle, Jang Song Thak, for insubordination. It was claimed that Jang and his five aides had been stripped naked and fed to 120 dogs. The ghastly method of execution, which was reported to have lasted an hour and been watched by North Korean officials, shocked the world. But the original source of the story was later traced back to Chinese satirical blog Tencent Weibo. In other words, it was a huge joke. Fast forward to 2015 and splashed across the headlines of newspapers, radio and TV was the appalling news that Kim Jong-un had executed one of his generals with an anti-aircraft gun for falling asleep during an official state event. The story was originally reported by South Korea's National Intelligence Agency, and not until the story had been circulated across the globe did they change their report to say the general had been purged for dozing off and could not confirm whether he was alive or not. For once, there was some truth in this that the general's death has since been confirmed, but the circumstances surrounding it are still unclear. It's believed he was executed after North Korean authorities gathered information against him from wiretapped conversations. When a story is reasonably true, it can be polluted with so much misinformation that it draws into question the entire report. Michael Madden, founder of North Korea Leadership Watch, says, It is time we nail the coffin closed on this rationale that DPRK officials get shot because they doze off at meetings. People are going to the well one too many times. Sadly for Mr. Madden, though, it seems like that well is far from dry, because in 2016 the news was plastered with headlines that Kim Jong-un had eliminated another of his generals, Ri Yong-gil. It took just a few months for those headlines to be followed by these when Ri was seen at a workers' party conference. So moving on from the grisly reports of assassination and execution, let's take a look at the utterly ridiculous stories that have been doing the rounds on the internet. In 2012, it was reported that an archaeologist had discovered a unicorn lair in Pyongyang, accompanied with a photoshopped horse. Everyone in the West thought it was hilarious, especially since this was an official report released by the Korean Central News Agency. They even went as far to say that hidden inside the lair was one of the unicorns ridden by the ancient Korean king, Jongmyeon. But this isn't as crazy as the media would have us think. The report has been assessed by Sung Yoon Lee, a professor at Tufts University, to be a symbolic piece of propaganda. My take is North Koreans don't believe all of that, but they bring certain symbolic value to celebrating your own identity, maybe even notions of cultural exceptionalism and superiority. It boosts morale. With North Korea's official news agencies releasing symbolic, but not necessarily true stories like this to the rest of the world, it's hard to establish what's fact and what's fiction in the reclusive state. So let's take a look at the more long-standing and more widely held beliefs about the country. Scenes like this have strengthened the perception that North Korea is a nation that functions as one in total uniformity. But Jun Bak, author of North Korea's Hidden Revolution, reminds us that North Korean people are just that. People. They're people with agency and preferences, and they do not comprise some imaginary, singularly defined group of people. Of the 30,000 defectors that have now settled in South Korea, around 80% of them come from two of the nine provinces inside North Korea. Do they all have the same beliefs and thoughts? Hardly. Back's research has shown that they're like any group of people, displaying a wide variety of opinions. You might be thinking, sure, of course the defectors show signs of protest and disagree with the regime. 
but North Korean citizens have a history of challenging the state. We're talking failed coups, assassination attempts, and even riots. We just don't hear about them. As far back as the Korean War itself in the 1950s, there was a rebel group of 22,000 North Koreans who fought against Kim Il-sung, the original supreme leader. And these sorts of incidents aren't exactly ancient history. In the 1980s, during a period of severe economic hardship, there were numerous clashes between the military and civilians over food shortages. These disputes ended in the deaths of thousands of farmers, laborers, and political prisoners. Things got even worse for the regime just a decade later, when the military themselves turned on the Kim family and plotted to assassinate key members, with the intention of putting General Oh Kuk Royal in charge. In the end, the general proved too loyal and reported the coup to the authorities. He remains a key figure in the current regime. But not all forms of protest in North Korea are violent. The new millennium also brought with it a new type of subversion. With smuggled information from the outside world, entering through forbidden goods like cell phones, CDs and DVDs. It's also reported that corrupt officials often overlook these contraband items and have even assisted defectors in escaping to China. So while scenes like this might imply some kind of obedient hive mind, life in North Korea is more fractured than the news would have us believe. Another problem with a lot of information we get about the secretive state is that it relies on the testimonies of defectors, who presumably don't really like the regime too much. But issues with defectors' stories run far deeper than that. As journalist Jai Yong Song found out after studying such testimonies for over 15 years. For a start, defectors are paid for their stories, and according to the South Korean Ministry of Unification, these fees can range from $50 to $500 per hour. The more shocking, exclusive, and emotional the story, the greater the fee. Basically, defectors have an incentive to exaggerate or simply make things up. Probably the most famous example of this is in the best-selling book Escape from Camp 14, the story of Shin dong Hyuk, who is the only person born in the gulags to have escaped. Nevertheless, when Shin's father claimed the stories were false, Shin confessed that some of his accounts were inaccurate. There is no doubt that North Korea has committed horrific human rights abuses, but examples like this raise questions about how reliant we should be on defectors' testimonies. Choi Song Chol from the Korean Nationality Residents Association explains that inconsistencies in defectors' stories are hard to identify. Most North Koreans do not worry about small factual mistakes as long as the big picture that North Korea violates human rights is right. This brings us on to the misconception that North Koreans only leave the country by defecting and escaping the regime. Although the West may have little to do with North Korea, many parts of Asia and even parts of Europe do have business with them. The so-called hermit state has logging projects going on in Russia and construction projects in Qatar. While over in Mongolia, North Koreans work producing goods for clothing brands like Australian surf company Rip Curl. Thousands actually work in China, many of them in North Korean restaurants. Heading further west, you can find many employed in Polish shipyards, construction sites, and farms. And if you ever pay a visit to Angkor Wat in Cambodia, then the museum there was built by a North Korean construction company. Each of these workers are believed to be handpicked from families that are loyal to the state, but even these loyalists have been known to defect. It's estimated that there are 50 to 100,000 North Koreans who have been sent to work abroad. Although it is claimed by human rights campaigners that 90% of their earnings are sent back to the regime, after having worked 10 to 12 hour shifts and a six day week. A claim which was refuted by the North Korean embassy in Warsaw, who stated in July 2016, This is all nonsense. Nobody is taking their salaries they work and make money for themselves. But according to a UN report from 2015, these overseas workers are big business for the North Korean state, earning the regime between $1.2 and $2.3 billion each year. And by earning this extra income, the human rights organizations claim that Pyongyang is trying to circumvent the international sanctions that aim to starve the state of its money over its controversial nuclear weapons program. 
Now, you've probably heard a lot about the potential threat posed by North Korea's nukes. But are we really all at risk of being obliterated by Kim Jong-un? Well, it seems like it depends on where you live. In April 2017, the Australian Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, was warned by General Vincent K. Brooke, the commander of US and UN forces in Korea, that Australia would soon be in range of North Korea's nuclear arsenal. But how close is North Korea from making intercontinental missiles capable of carrying a nuclear warhead? According to recent news reports, North Korea has launched more test missiles and detonated more nuclear bombs than ever since Kim Jong-un came to power in 2011. What about the rocket? You last next year. With three of the five nuclear tests being conducted under his reign, and a whopping 90 missile launches up until May 2017. The regime has also claimed that the underground nuclear detonation in September 2016 tested a warhead that can successfully be mounted on a missile. And in 2017, a series of missile tests that landed in the Sea of Japan rose tensions that led to the US starting joint military drills with South Korea, plus a whole heap of provocative exchanges between the US and North Korea. Obviously, North Korea is a big, big problem, and we will deal with that very strongly. If the US and the South try to ignite the spark of war, we will wipe out all of the invaders without a trace with our strong, preemptive nuclear strike. At another test launch in May 2017, North Korea claimed its missile, called the Hwasong-12, was a ballistic missile capable of carrying a heavy nuclear payload. Put this, together with the claimed results of the September nuclear test, and hey presto, North Korea should have a nuke. Okay, so let's park the nuclear stuff for now. I guess the question any American viewers are asking is, this is great, but how far are they from being able to hit good old US territory with a long-range missile? To understand this, we need to know the basics of how a nuclear intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM, works. And for this, we need diagrams. Lots of lovely diagrams. So, the missile fires straight up under the power of all its engines. Then, at a specified distance above the Earth, it is guided into an arc, which is calculated to again hit the Earth over 5,500 kilometers away. After the initial thrust, the booster section disconnects. The ICBM then continues on its remaining engine until it hits its maximum speed. Now, the re-entry vehicle containing the payload, in this case the nuclear warhead, will separate from the rest of the missile and continue traveling above the Earth's atmosphere. Then, when it reaches its target area, it is guided to re-enter the atmosphere. The problem at this point is that the payload risks burning up and disintegrating, much like a meteor does when it enters our outer atmosphere. So, the re-entry vehicle must be stable enough to withstand this descent. That's it in a nutshell. Okay, so that made it seem really easy. But for North Korea to be able to strike the US, they would need a missile to fly at least 8,000 kilometers. The recent Hwasong test only flew a lateral distance of 787 kilometers. But this was fired at a very steep angle in order to avoid flying over neighboring countries and was on a trajectory that reached an altitude of 2,211.5 kilometers. These statements were released by North Korea's official news agency and are consistent with the South's and Japan's assessments. It's estimated that if the Hwasong-12 was fired at a standard trajectory, then the missile would likely have reached a lateral distance of at least 4,000 kilometers. While this may not be enough to strike the US or qualify it as an ICBM, it helped them take a big step forward in developing an intermediate range ballistic missile, or IRBM. And a week after that test, North Korea launched the Buguk-Song-2, a medium-range ballistic missile which traveled approximately 480 kilometers. The KCNA State News Agency claim it was so successful that it will be put into mass production, even though it was only its second ever test launch. But could their current development of an intercontinental ballistic missile withstand atmospheric re-entry? It's believed that the high altitude that the Hwasong-12 reached during its test launch was also to assess its re-entry capabilities, with KCNA reporting that the missile's homing feature made it possible to survive re-entry under the worst possible conditions and allow it to still accurately detonate. The South Korean military, however, said it was unlikely that the North had developed its atmospheric re-entry to this level, a point reinforced by German aerospace engineer Marcus Schiller. 
We do not know if the re-entry vehicle survived this hell of a ride, and even if it did, we do not know if North Korea can build a payload that will also survive this ride. South Korea's Science and Technology Policy Institute believes it's still difficult to judge when the North will have a reliably tested ICBM, saying that developed countries will have tested at least 20 ICBMs with a success rate of 90% before they'd be ready to deploy. Professor Siegfried Hecker, an expert on plutonium at Stanford University, suggests... At the current pace, North Korea may be able to make the technological progress required for a nuclear-tipped ICBM in five or so years. Either way, North Korea is continuing its nuclear program in defiance of increased UN sanctions, and recent satellite images indicate that more nuclear tests may be planned. But to turn all of this on its head, Mr. Schiller is skeptical about whether the North has even actually developed a working nuclear warhead and... Not just some nuclear device that goes boom in a tunnel under laboratory conditions. So what can be done with a problem like North Korea? Sanctions don't seem to have the desired effect or are possibly being circumvented by cunning money-making schemes. So what about a military response? If the US were to launch a preemptive strike on North Korea, Experts believe there is no conceivable way of destroying all of their nuclear weapons. The US wouldn't know where they all were, plus road mobile and submarine launched missiles are currently being developed. Even if it was possible to destroy all of them, they wouldn't be able to strike without causing them to detonate, creating a mushroom cloud across the Korean peninsula. And with the South's capital city, Seoul, and its 10 million inhabitants only 56 kilometers from the North Korean border, the number of casualties would be colossal. When North Korea first began developing their nuclear capabilities, the US president at the time, Bill Clinton, considered a military strike, and the estimated casualties then were in the hundreds of thousands, and that was before they had nuclear weapons. Professor Siegfried Hecker believes the US and South Korea consider the consequences of military intervention unacceptably high, and that they will only take the military option if North Korea initiates them first. It is quite clear that North Korea wants to threaten Washington with such a capability, but to launch would be suicidal, and I don't believe the regime is suicidal. This was reinforced by statements from the Aerospace Corp in April 2017. The imminent threat is to South Korea and Japan. North Korea's first response will not be nuclear. It might not even involve missiles. They have several levels of escalation to go before they get to nuclear weapons. In the meantime, the US has deployed the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Anti-Missile System, or THAAD, to South Korea, which acts as a missile defense shield that will intercept any short to medium range missiles. Sure, all of this talk about a fiery nuclear apocalypse sounds terrifying, but even after all of this, we still can't be sure just how close North Korea is to joining the nuclear weapons club. Yet one thing is for sure, not everything you hear about North Korea is true. Hope you learned something new, and if you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and maybe even share our videos. If you want more myths and misconceptions debunked, then click on the video playing on screen now. Thanks for watching. The effects of exposure to space differ greatly depending on which movie you're watching.